Um, and he was in general practice, also in Cedarburg. Well, he practiced in Milwaukee. Milwaukee is a, um, was 25 miles south of Cedarburg, kind of considered a suburb of Milwaukee. So he practiced in Milwaukee, and we lived in Cedarburg. Um, and then your grandfather, his father, Roland Steinle the first, was also a lawyer. That's correct. A lawyer, a judge, and eventually uh, sat on the Supreme Court. Um, and he was also in Milwaukee. That's correct. Correct. So, Roland, can you uh, tell the story about how you decided to be a lawyer? Um, during high school, uh, I went. Um, I was went to Market High School, the Jesuit Prep School in Milwaukee, and on Saturdays, I, would, uh, I was on the swimming team, so I'd have to get up early and take the bus into uh, Milwaukee to go to swimming practice. And when I finished, I would meet my father at the office where he shared with his, his father. And my grandfather, who was about 70, 68, 70 at the time, would be there. So I'd sit in the office and uh, just talk with my grandfather. He was a great storyteller. He was a big guy. He was like six foot four, three. 280 pounds, but you know, just a really outspoken guy going. He was a politician his whole life, type of guy. So he would sit and he'd tell me stories. And it was because of my grandfather that I decided that I really wanted to be a lawyer. He had been pretty much a public servant most of his life and didn't make a he wasn't rich, he wasn't anything, he wasn't for the money, he just loved practicing law. And he loved being a public servant, and so I decided that that was a career that would uh, interest me. Well, you do come from a long tradition because his father was a lawyer also. Joseph, jo Joseph is that correct? No, his father died once before he was born. So, uh, uh -huh. um, so he was an only child, and... Uh, uh, really a self-made man. Uh, his mother and her sister ended up running a boarding house to support the family. His father died in 1890 with an influenza uh, pandemic at the time in 1898. Um, so, but he worked his way and got all the way through and uh, after he came back from World War One, he finished up law school and, and uh, Took the bar, passed the bar, and started practicing law. Right. So this this was the family profession in many ways. Um, your family was from Germany. That's correct. Um, on Steinle both sides. Family family from Germany. Stuttgart. My mother's family um, was from more Eastern Germany, from what we can tell. Mother's Yale. E e h l. But uh, mm -hmm. on the Steinle side of the family, there was some uh, English, Irish, and French. So, um, so we were pretty much a little bit of everything in there. Right. Um, now, when you so you went to um, you went to high school in Milwaukee. Is that correct? That's correct. And in the course of that, you also spent time with your grandmothers. Yes, my mother's mother. The first two years, I wanted to go to a football game or, or do anything in Milwaukee. I just spend the night with my grandmother who lived on the south side of Milwaukee. And with her German heritage, she had fed me uh, German potato pancakes, homemade uh, applesauce with cinnamon, and uh, and the usual uh, German pastries, Kuchen, and uh, a lot of the other, mm -hmm. one way or the other. Um, after high school, you stayed in Milwaukee and went to Marquette? Marquette University uh -huh. and then on Law School. A Marquette Law School. And both your father, your father went to Marquette Law School. Did your grandfather also? Yes. Okay. 
So then after you graduated, um, to, you know, just tell us about the early years of your career. The first five years I worked for um, a lawyer in practice who primary uh, practice was criminal defense work. But uh, when he took in divorce work or injury work, I ended up doing most of that kind of work for him and then assisted on his, on his criminal cases. And then after five years, I went in private practice and uh, even though I love criminal work, my day to build was family law. Um, I represent a lot of blue collar clients. One of my best feeders was the woman in the home growing small hairdresser shop. She sent me clients all the time. And in 1984, I decided I wanted to leave Wisconsin. And, and, I, and I looked around and finally um, I found a job in Phoenix, Arizona. In late '85, and um, I had a pass the bar, so I studied for the Arizona bar. And in the spring of '86, I passed the bar. And lo and behold, a month later, they had an opening at the public the public office, and they gave and they gave me credit for all ten years experience to uh, Arizona. Now, during this time, how would you? Describe your spiritual life. Um, spiritual life was not really a major player in my life. I didn't. I, I was brought up Catholic. I went to Catholic grade school, high school, college, and law school, but I wasn't practicing. I wasn't going to church. Um, I've been divorced for about five or six years. Um, in, in the early uh, 90s, I was working a ton of hours. I was doing that uh, because I had 10 years of experience. I was a, I was being assigned some of the most difficult capital death penalty cases they had in the office. And um, uh, I started to experience some issues. And I sought counseling and uh, I had workaholic issues. And um, during my counseling for about a year, year and a half, my counselor, who was pretty perceptive, told me that I had to introduce some spirituality in my life. And I equated spirituality with religion and quickly dismissed the, the concept. My counselor retired, and I continued to. Uh, Worked for the public defender offices down there, continued to do uh, a lot of uh, in 1990. I switched to a different office, and all I did for five years was first, first degree, degree cases, which was real mm -hmm. stressful. I mm -hmm. cases, but they're all murder, capital murder cases. And then uh, 2001, I got appointed by the governor of Arizona to be a Superior Court judge. And uh, then I became a judge. So at the time you became a judge, you had been practicing law for how long? I got out of law school in 19. I got out of law school in 19. 19. 19. 19. 19. 25 years. 25 years. Um, can you describe to us, as you've described to me, uh, what you were like as a judge in those years? Well, I tried to model myself after some of the judges that I respected. And I thought I would take an approach of I expected the lawyers to follow the rules, to be on time, and to uh, be prepared. I wanted to be a no-nonsense judge. And having practiced law for 25 years, and uh, I thought that uh, um, I knew everything. everything. I'll admit at one point in my life, I admitted earlier years ago that uh, my eye that is, is I knew everything and uh, kind of dominated my life at that point. And how did this show up in terms of how you related to the lawyers who came to your court and their clients? Well, I tended to be rather short. And uh, the we had uh, judicial performance review, and the 
the surveys, not a lot of surveys were ever returned, but some of the surveys that come back said that I was um, not a good listener. I was dismissive. I was arrogant and uh, short with the lawyers. And uh, so, but that all comes from that personality of where uh, mm. um, I was running a really, really tight ship. And I was really, really trying to um, get things done. And I really didn't want to uh, spend any time listening. I, I was not a good listener. Um, so you, in 2005, um, started to address a concern you had about your health. Yes, in 2005, um, um, I, both my father and my grandfather had cardiac issues. And I was at, at that point 53 years old. Mm. And the cardiologist that I saw kept telling me there were no issues, there were no issues. And I wasn't satisfied with the response I was getting. So I, my sister was a nurse in Prescott, which is an orthopedic. I uh, talked to a friend of hers who was a pediatric cardiologist. Um, and uh, she suggested I see a, a doctor that she thought was really, really good. Mm -hmm. So I went and saw him, and he did an echocardiogram. And he said the good news was that I wasn't going to have a heart attack. The bad news was it was only a question of when I was going to have my first stroke, not him. You know. Well, all of a sudden he got my attention really, really quickly. And I began the usual course of beta blockers um, and um, the um, usual course of blood thinners and that type of thing. And um, Pretty much told me I'd be medicated the rest of my life, life. and uh, uh, but I had to find some way to systematically reduce stress in my life. Mm -hmm. blood pressure 150 over uh, my knee, so I was really cranked up there. But you know, I was doing really high end, difficult cases in 2005. I was just finishing up right? three years of therapy, three years of high stress. Which really high strength work, uh, most of them were, were unrepresented. And all of the differences. And I had just started back work and I was working on some, because of my background, I was pretty assigned a lot of the capital death. Um, um, so I was looking for some alternatives one way or another. Um, how old was your father when he died? 84. 84. And your grandfather? 84. 70. 70. 70. Yeah. Um, now, we, we are just about to take a break. And when we come back for the break, uh, I just want to start on the story of what you decided to do to manage your stress which I think starts the next chapter of your story. Um, this is Mercy Russell with a Remarkable Relationship Show. And I'm um, sitting here today with Ronald S., uh, who is, we call just Ronald, or <laughs> he calls himself that. And um, we're talking today about his career as a judge and his spiritual path and how those two have intertwined and affected each other. Um, so we'll be back after the break. Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Norman, your health tip of the day from the African American Wellness Project. Infections like polio, smallpox, and measles used to be as common as coronavirus is today. But now we have life-saving vaccines for those and other diseases. Sadly, too many children still go unvaccinated. Choosing to delay or refuse vaccine puts your child and other children at serious risk. So talk to your child's doctor today about vaccines. 
And for more information, visit aawellnessproject.org. Hi, tune in to my new show, The Remarkable Relationship Show, with me, Mercy Russell. I bring a fresh perspective on all things related to how humans develop their individual brilliance while navigating the excitement, stickiness, and resistance in their relationships. Wednesdays from 9 to 10 a.m. And you can visit my website at leadershipwithmercy.com. Multicultural, multidimensional even. Alternative Talk 1150. Hello, this is Mercy Russell of the Remarkable Relationship Show, and I'm here today talking to not Ronald, but Roland, <laughs> and I just, uh, um, Roland told me a funny story about people doing what I just did, and I'm going to let him tell you that story about calling him by the wrong name. You know, as a judge, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people that wasn't so bad, that was a typical mix-up even in everyday life. But when someone put on a pleading, they mistyped uh, the honorable, put the horrible. That got a little bit of pain one day, but uh, <laughs> still, but mistake is typical. So, so they called you the horrible. Yes. And, and curious of, you know, humorously got your name wrong. So it sort of undercut that insult, yes. right? Um, oh, great. So we have just talked about um, uh, the, your early life, your career, your family history of law and how you became a judge. And then also just, you know, kind of being a, excuse my language, but a hard ass judge when you <laughs> entered this path that was really uh, instigated by your, uh, your concerns about your family history of heart disease. Um, so one of the things you did when you realized that you had a high risk of a having a stroke eventually was to take some steps to manage your stress. What did you do? Can you tell us more about that? The, the doctor had said you have to find, and, and I took his response to be, you have to look at alternative medicine for some solutions to reduce stress in your life. And in 2006, two of friends were trying to create a business that would offer retreats for women in their early 40s in California, meditation, yoga, at really high-end resorts where they could get massages and the rest of it. And they found a meditation teacher in Sedona, and uh, they went up and learned how to meditate and talk to them about their business. And one of the two asked me if I'd be willing to go up with her husband to learn how to meditate because he was one of the personalities that could never sit still. And he wouldn't go up because it wasn't a guy sort of thing to do to go learn to meditate. And it was a two-day event, Saturday afternoon and Sunday. And so... Who do you ask? Ask Rob. He would go up, and so I go up with him. But I did it again. In the back of my mind, the doctor had said I got to find alternatives, and I had heard about meditation to help people reduce stress in your life. And so off I went. And the week before we went up there, he bailed out on me, and so I went up myself and I meditate. <laughs> and that became the path, and uh -huh. later on, a few years, three, four years later, my meditation teacher wrote her own book, and I became a page in her book, The Accident of Meditate. And uh, keeping the story going by 2010, I was kind of a crisis meditator for about three years, and in 2008, 2009, I had prostate cancer and I had to uh, I chose to go through radiation treatment but it was during that time I went through radiation treatment I became a dedicated meditator twice, twice a day 30 minutes in the morning 30 minutes in the afternoon I uh, lost uh, 35 pounds 
and I had started shrinking my heart actually, and my blood pressure went down from one point down to uh, one hundred or sixty-five. And um, the uh, weight loss people in the cardiology got together and took me off the beta blockers, with the drug I was never going to get off of, and uh, told me that I was doing really well. My heart started shrinking back to all the parameters. So the consistent meditation that I was doing every day seemed to be having actual physical positive effects on my health. So, um, yeah, and then shortly thereafter, my meditation teacher Sarah told me that Deepak Chopra was coming to Phoenix to do his physical health program during the healing. And I should attend and I should do my meditation training to re energize all. So, I'll off I can get that. Um, Roland, I'm going to interrupt you for a moment. I think. I just want to say to our audience that we are sitting um, in a room where, with a, a, I think a somewhat unstable internet connection, and um, I'm gonna. We're just gonna. I'm gonna pause for a moment. Hopefully, you won't see it because our producer will keep this going smoothly. But I want to exchange places with Roland so he has the more stable part of the connection because I hear him breaking up, and I I don't want you to miss his story. So we'll be back in just a second. So we've exchanged places. Time is funny. Sometimes it seems fast, another time slow. When it comes to time slots remaining on Alternative Talk 1150, time is running out. In fact, there are just a few primetime slots available. So if you want to host your own radio program, the time to call 425-653-1150 is right now. Nope, no time for excuses. Dial 425-653-1150 to find out how affordable it can be to host a radio show. Alternative Talk, we have an opportunity waiting just for you. Hi, tune into my new show, The Remarkable Relationship Show, with me, Mercy Russell. I bring a fresh perspective on all things related to how humans develop their individual brilliance while navigating the excitement, stickiness, and resistance in their relationships. Wednesdays from 9 to 10 a.m. And you can visit my website at leadershipwithmercy.com. Ready to shake things up? Try Alternative Talk 1150. David G said, if you really want to be a dedicated meditator, you should become a teacher. And David G is this hugely dynamic person. So off I went. I had to complete another course called Seduction of Spirit, which was a week-long event. And then I had to complete the certification course, which was very, very difficult. But I completed it. And then after completing it, um, I continued at the Chopra Center and completed two more teacher certification programs, Perfect Health and later yoga teacher training, the 200-hour teacher training. And I became uh, a Vedic educator, having completed all three. And I started teaching meditation and yoga in Phoenix, actually. I was teaching yoga at the county uh, fitness center. And sooner than you knew, uh, People started recognizing the fact that I was teaching mm -hmm. yoga and I became the yoga judge. <laughs> so was this like the lawyers or the staff? Well, yeah, the lawyers, anybody that worked for the county could go to the fitness center. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. And so, uh, uh, so I had a couple of judges and maybe three or four lawyers that come every Monday mm -hmm. to my yoga class, as well as staff members who were, you know, that were in, working in the court uh -huh. system. And what year was this that you were teaching now? 2012 through uh, 2018. Uh-huh. So um, tell, can you just describe um, during this period of time, you've also studied with Byron Katie um, and had these advanced meditation training courses. What 
what effect did it have on at this time on how you how did you start to integrate what you were experiencing with your practice as a judge? Well, there is a concept that runs through both meditation uh, and Eckhart Tolle talks a lot about it in his books, especially The New Earth. And um, it's what I call the pause. Mm -hmm. Viktor Frankl talks about it. It's the space between the stimulus and your reaction to the stimulus. And, and Viktor Frankl says it's in the space that we have the freedom to make a choice in how we respond. And, but Eckhart Tolle talks about it in terms of you develop an awareness or a consciousness that what you've done, you may have done, you, you, I may have said something or done something or may not have been totally kind to a lawyer in front of me and I go in the office and say, oh, I didn't really handle that so good. Mm -hmm. And then, but that's five minutes after I shoot out the lawyer. But Eckhart Tolle says eventually that five minutes goes to two minutes, goes to one minute. And eventually while you're there, before you even start to chew out the lawyer, you go, no, that's not what I'm going to do today. This is how I'm going to handle it. Or you're going to say, okay, we're going to take a break and I'll make a decision on how I'm going to do this. And when I come out, it's going to be a whole different way I would have handled it before. And um, um, in meditation, you start creating this ability to sit out and, and take a break in your life. You know, whether it be for 15 minutes or 30 minutes, you try to create that break in your life. So you start building in that ability to take a pause before you start responding to what happens every day. Mm -hmm. When you meditate in the morning, it's not because of what happens during that, in my case, 30 minutes in the morning. If I meditate for 30 minutes in the morning at 11 o'clock in the day when I'm having a particularly, in my judgment, annoying lawyer in front of me, <laughs> I'm going to be a lot more reflective mm -hmm. in terms of how I handle him and less reactive because I meditated. Mm -hmm. So I'm moving through um, really 2008, 2009, especially 2011 and 2013, moving from being more of a strict, no nonsense, reactive type person to a much more reflective attitude. In other words, in 2008, I believed every lawyer should show up to court on time, be prepared, and uh, and uh, follow every rule to the letter. And if they didn't do it, they're going to hear it from me. By 2011, I believed I could show up to court on time, I could be prepared, and I would follow the rules. The lawyers didn't show up on time, not my problem. The, they didn't follow the rules, not my problem. They weren't prepared. Not my problem. There may be consequences, but I'm not there to make sure that they do their job. If they didn't file a motion properly, well, they didn't get the relief, but I wasn't there to lecture anybody. So was I was much, much less reactive, which really made my day much, much more pleasant. And obviously, if my day was much more pleasant, I was much less stressful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Um, um, uh, you know, I tell I used to tell my kids that I got rid of the three dirty words of every parent should get rid of, would have, could have, and should have. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, what should a lawyer do? I could tell every lawyer what they should do. What would I have done? I could tell them that from now to the time the cows come home. What could have they have done? I could tell them that. But the bottom line is, is um, I'm entitled to the actions that I take, but I'm not entitled to the results of those actions. That's core yoga doctrine, uh, one way or the other. You do your actions for action's sake and whatever falls from there, you do it. But what happens to me is I become much more reflective. My life is much more calmer, much more serene mm -hmm. because I'm not taking as much responsibility that someone else isn't doing their job. Right. So we need to take another break. Okay. Um, this is Mercy Russell of the Remarkable Relationship Show. I'm here today with Ro with Just Roland and his the spiritual path as a judge. When we come back, I'm going to ask Roland to talk more 
about uh, how this also affected his work with the clients who were in front of him in the courtroom. And um, then several other things that he's talked to me about, including discernment, which I think is a really important concept. And I um, have been really interested to hear um, Roland talk about it. So we'll be back in a few moments. Saving Great Animals, a Seattle-based dog rescue organization, matches families with dogs that are the best fit. Dogs that come from overcrowded animal control shelters, from abandonment or neglect. The key to Saving Great Animals' success is a trial adoption program, including training and counsel as needed. This way, you know you have the right dog before the adoption is final. Saving Great Animals relies solely on donations, so please visit Saving Great Animals animals.org today multicultural multi-dimensional even alternative talk 1150 hello this is mercy russell with a remarkable relationship show and i'm here today with just Roland. Uh, he's talking about his spiritual path as a judge. Uh, he's just been telling us about his, uh, how, his, how his spiritual path began uh, and how he began to integrate it into his attitude toward and his behavior as a judge. And you were just also, you were talking primarily about how you related to the lawyers in your courtroom, which I assume are your sort of, in a way, your basic clients. But also, I, you talked to me about how you, how you changed your way of relating to, the, to their clients who were there in front of you. So um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, in 2011, because we did rotations to different areas of law, I was moved to juvenile court, which was on which was interesting because now I'm um, getting fully kind of integrated into the yoga philosophy of life. And now I'm dealing with very young people. And I'm dealing both with juveniles that are charged with crimes, what we call delinquents. And we're also dealing with people who, families whose children were taken from them and they were in dependencies and then in some cases where the state wanted to terminate the rights. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'd like to do is talk a little bit more about the juvenile delinquents. Um, mm -hmm. The area of the county that I had the cases coming from was the poorest area of Maricopa County and it included probably the highest number of people that did not have or not documented Mm -hmm. within the United within the United States. And um, you know, the problem was is resources were not really available one way or the other. And um, you know, with every child that came before me, there was always a story. And I think that the classic story was a young kid uh, that came in front of me and, and the, if you look at the record, you'd want to say this kid's a hopeless juvenile delinquent. He's had a half a dozen shopliftings. He had a number of four or five violations of various drugs, mostly marijuana. And I'm trying to use my 60-year-old mind and try to rationalize with him that he should stop using drugs and the whole nine yards. And uh, started... Uh, talking with the probation officer and she kind of explained it. She set the stage. She said, well, judge, you got to understand his, his father, no one's really seen in 10 years. His uh, mother is not documented. The only thing she gets is food stamps to $100 a month. She's functioning, but not very well. So when the kids are hungry, they go to the grocery store and they eat while they go up and down the aisle. And then when they need clothes, they go to Walmart and shoplift. I you know, get clothes mm -hmm. and then leave the store. 
Um, so I'm trying to talk to him and I'm going, well, you know, you really need to work on this and the whole thing. He says, judge, I'll make you a deal. Come to my house for the weekend. And if you're not smoking marijuana with me in the backyard, after you spent a weekend with me in my house with no air conditioning and most of the windows broken out, he says, I'll give you a prize. <laughs> well, what it did is it told me that I needed to be a really, really good listener because even though the paper tells me one thing, the record tells me one thing, it doesn't tell me what the individual is going to. So I have to become a really, really good listener to discern the individual from the what's in the paper. And that's where we get into the discernment part of it, because you can have two people with the same criminal record, same background, and there may be real differences. And so I just started making a huge point that I wasn't sending anybody to any kind of confinement without talking to them and trying to figure out whether or not based upon my background, or as a public defender, I have over 2,500 cases in 15 years. I had a caseload of about 150 cases, felony cases a year. They'd done over um, 100 homicide cases. So I had a wealth of background. So it was very easy for me to say, I know all, all about these people. I don't need to, someone to tell me about them. But mm -hmm. instead, I turned around and said, okay, well, I, I've experienced a lot, but I still need to talk to the individuals. And so that's what I started to do is... Mm -hmm tried to turn on my listening skills and listen to what they had to say. So every time I sentenced someone, after the lawyers did their, you know, every defense lawyer wanted probation, no jail. Every prosecutor wanted to send them to prison for the maximum sentence. And I just say, sir, I really, really wanted to sit and talk to you for a few minutes. And I see you've had a difficult background, but tell me, what's going on in this case and why is this case different than other cases and why is there some hope here that we can change your mm -hmm. life around? And it'd be remarkable the stories that you would hear. And there was, there's always a story for every time they're there. Some of them aren't very good, I admit that, and some of them probably deserve to be warehoused and some of them got warehoused. But there are a lot of cases out there where, believe it or not, uh, the law can be draconian mm -hmm. and someone doesn't need to go to prison for eight years because they had a small little amount of methamphetamines on their system because they had four or five prior felonies on their system. They were bipolar and they didn't have the money to get their, you know, the necessary drugs for their bipolar personality. So I I think it became really clear to me that my number one skill that I needed to develop and was one, to be a good listener, and two, is to develop a discernment mm -hmm. between those that really needed a break and those that didn't. But that all came from this ability to pause and reflect and then try to be reflective in terms of the, the response to what was in front of me. Right. And you, you part of what you were doing, that you, this is the way you described it, is you were beginning to, you were learning to balance empathy with judgment. You still had to judge. You still had to make a decision about what the outcome was for these people who've been brought before you who generally committed crimes, even children. So, or, so um, it, it was an ongoing process. I really like the way you talk about the difference between discernment and wisdom. Yeah, um, we have the serenity prayer, and it's um, God grant me the ability to see the circumstances where I can change those that I cannot change and the wisdom to know the difference. And I now I say uh, the discernment to know the difference mm -hmm. because I don't think there's any special wisdom or knowledge out there that can instantaneously tell anybody the, when you can change things and when you can't change things. So I use the, the term discernment. It's a little bit more fine. Uh, they say a goose can skim milk off the surface of what the water. Mm -hmm. That's how fine the goose's discernment is. And in a lot of these cases now, at least in, in the jurisdiction that I practiced in, we had mandatory sentencing. So most of the time, it wasn't a question of giving a you know, four-time felon probation or 
and no jail versus not going to prison. Most of the time, the difference was, am I going to send them to prison for 10 years versus four years? Mm-hmm. You know, so it wasn't let them go or not let them go is the difference. But, you know, from a lawyer's standpoint, from, you know, standing in front of you, they think it's a math game. That there is no mm-hmm. difference between four years and eight years. Well, you know, there is a difference in terms of human life, but the difference between four years and eight years is. and. Uh, and so if I had the choice of sending someone to jail for a very small amount of drugs for four years versus eight years, to me, I'm going to hear the story. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I tried to listen. I tried to try to make a sound decision as based upon my experience of being a defense lawyer for in, in a public defender for 15 years and having sat with. And one of my real value as a public defender, one of my real tools in the chest was my ability to go over to the jail and talk to people and try to find out what they wanted mm-hmm. and listen to them. And so I, what I ended up doing is through my spiritual work is kind of went back to the roots of being able to listen to people and try to do what I thought was the most just thing under the circumstances. But that really came down to discernment and, um, and, 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 and empathy um, uh, one way or the other, but I had some rather nasty cases, and in some cases, uh, um, but we, at least in where I practice, the, the jury made the decision life or death. Mm-hmm. The one time it was my decision, the family absolutely did not want death. He had killed his mother, and every one of the siblings came in and did not want death for a lot of reasons. And um, the prosecutor just didn't want to back away from it, and so. Um, I think everybody was happy with the decision I made. It's just that they didn't want to make it. But it's um, but it's this whole idea that before you charge ahead, you got to get out of that mindset that you know the answer right off the bat, and you're going to immediately respond uh, to things. You know, with text messages and emails and Instagram and everything else, we. We get a text and somehow we feel there's an absolute necessity to respond instantly to that text message rather mm-hmm. than take a few minutes and, and try to be more reflective in terms of what kind of response are we going to send back out there. And we now know that you send out, you post something on Facebook or Instagram, five years later, you know, an employer at a, at a large law firm gets access to what you put on Facebook and you don't get a job. Mm-hmm. Right. So. so the great consequences now, even on just our little social yeah. lives. So in, we have about, we have only have about four minutes left. Okay. And I just want to talk about you. You're now retired several years since juvenile court. Um, what are you, where are what where what next for you and where are you in your spiritual studies what are you thinking about in terms of your your work you know your your uh work in the world where, where are you with this well after i retired from the bench in, in the summer of 2016 i worked for the attorney general for two and a half years and my choice my choice mm-hmm. was to work with brand new lawyers on their first trials mm-hmm. Because I thought if I could teach them good skills, and part of that now, because I now felt that I knew about stress and mm-hmm. how to alleviate stress in your life, I could teach them a little bit about balance. So I did that for two and a half years. But after that, I kind of did another deep dive into meditation. I completed meditation teacher training with David G, and then advanced teacher training with David G. I've been doing all kinds of different courses into yoga philosophy and the Upanishads and, and uh, some of the other ancient texts uh, uh, on one way or the other, uh, reading some of the more modern uh, uh, meditation teachers, Emma Chodron, Ram Das um, is one of my more favorite ones. And they all, like Ram Das is real big into the concept of uh, getting out of the rational brain and, and, and starting to more in intuition. Our mutual mm-hmm. friend, Marie mm-hmm. Manchuri, is very, very big into intuition, is getting out of your rational brain and in, intuition. So that is where I'm, I'm moving. What, what I, where I want to go, I'm 
71. So um, um, I hope I live to 171, but <laughs> the probabilities are probably not great. But I really still love going back into it and, and looking at how some of these people seem to um, seem to capture a lot of these things are coming up that are I hear it one time and all of a sudden I'm reading another book and Ram Das is saying the United States no one uh, everybody favors the rational mind and they downplay the intuitive mind and he quotes Einstein. Mm -hmm. says Einstein's theory of relativity was not based on the rational mind, it was based mm -hmm. upon the intuitive mind. And uh, um, he tell, and then another person tells me the funny story about Einstein. Einstein, he goes to a grade school and the kid asks him, how do you, um, how can I become as smart as you? And he said, read fairy tales. He says, how can I be smarter than you? He says, read more fairy tales. <laughs> so uh -huh. this whole concept of, of the intuition and making conscious decisions based upon intuition um, is just things that fascinate me. But the, staying with this whole concept of um, making sure that if something triggers me and things still trigger me, I mean, there are mm -hmm. people that I, even today, I just have to stay away from because they trigger bad reactions in me. And uh, so, but I got to make sure that there is that, that, space between the stimulus and my response because then i have the freedom to decide how am i going to respond right we've taught we i we talked a little bit this morning about uh just you know your experience you've been spending a lot more time in milwaukee near your children and grandchildren and just you know that experience of going back home and kind of being in your family and having reactions that are very familiar but I think that what you're talking about, just you know, to a little bit from my point of view, is that those skills you're learning are exactly the skills one needs to be a little different in those relationships too. And um, at any rate, that's just sort of my little digression. Um, well, we are, our time is just about up. I do want to mention that we didn't really talk about why I'm calling you just Roland instead of by your whole name. Um, so I don't know if you want to say a few things about that. Okay, and well. Then we'll make it quick because. I'll make it very Betty's quick. Betty's going to cut us off. Soon as I, <laughs> as soon as I became a judge, I lost my first name. And even now, if I travel back to Phoenix, mm -hmm. if I go someplace, it's judge this and judge that. And even though I haven't been a judge for six years, I'm still judge. And uh, I just want to be just me. Mm -hmm. Just Roland, small J, small R, and I have a little bracelet with the initials small J, small, small R, R. <laughs> to remind me every day, and I wore this since 2012, so during the day when I was on the bench, that anytime I started getting all worked up, I just looked at my bracelet and said, you're just Roland. And the nice part is, we all play a role in a Shakespearean play every day, mm -hmm. and as a judge, at the end of the day, I actually had to take my costume, my robe off, and hang it up. Right. So that helps. Yes. Oh, darn it. So, it so then I could take my robe off, and I was no longer judge timely. I was just rolling. I could go home. Uh -huh. I love that, you know. So, um, so this is Mercy Russell of the Remarkable Relationship Show. I've been talking today to just Roland. <laughs> and um, we've been talking about his spiritual path as a judge. Um, I don't have a, you know, we, I don't, because he's just Ro Roland, if you would like to contact him, please feel free to email me at mercyburtonrussell at gmail.com. Um, and uh, I will be happy to pass along any kind of comments or questions you have or get you in touch with Roland more in terms of his, in, in respect to his experience and also, as you can tell, his deep training as a Vedic meditation expert and teacher. So anyway, thank you very much for joining us today. This is Mercy Russell of the Remarkable Relationship Show. Mm -hmm.